Deacon William Grimes is next. He operates a free clinic, so he speaks here as both a faith leader and a health care provider. Good morning. I have been in Eastern Kentucky for 40 years. I started out uh, with St. Clair Medical Center uh, bringing health care to Bath County where there was no clinic. Uh, I have served the, uh, the health care needs of Eastern Kentucky for these entire 40 years. Approximately 20 years ago, or I'm sorry, 16 years ago in 2000, uh, a group of us started a free clinic in Owingsville, Kentucky. The reason we started it is we found that so many of our patients were unable to get the care they needed because of the expense of health care and because they didn't have insurance. Uh, so we started a, a free clinic in the year 2000, and by 2002, we had over 3,000 patients. Now, I'm working in the, the poorest, or one of the poorest areas in eastern Kentucky. There's Bath and Menifee and Wolf and Morgan and, and other, like Rowan and Montgomery and, and Fleming. Uh, here's the thing about the people in, uh, that are uninsured. And, and I agree totally with everything I have heard so far. But what people don't realize is that the uninsured are uninsured because they can't afford health care. They can't afford insurance. I have patients who do, I am amazed when they fill out their paperwork and the income says zero. Is it zero income? You must get money from somewhere. No, I make no money at all. How do they exist? I have patients who will come in and they need you know, they're diabetic, they're hypertensive, they, they, they need medication, they need lab work, they need a good exam. We can do all that. We can't do a, a CT scan, we can't do a colonoscopy, we can't do other things because we just can't afford that. Sometimes when these people come in and, you know, we try to give them medicine, we have stock medicine, we have, uh, you know, uh, samples, sometimes we don't have what they need and we say, okay, well, I can write you a $4 generic prescription. I'm sorry, but I can't afford it. You know, the last $10 that I was able to borrow, I had to pay for gas to get here, okay? So people, you know, if, if all of a sudden we say to these people, you're no longer insured, you know, it's devastating. It, it, you just don't understand how devastating it is. When the Affordable Care Act went into effect and Connect opened, Connect opened up in the state of Kentucky, about a thousand of my patients got Medicaid, and that was wonderful. I hated to lose them because we became attached to each other. I mean, these were people that we, we've come to love and know and care for, but they got Medicaid, so they're really better off. And a lot of them are gonna lose Medicaid. Or if they can't pay $4 generic, how are they gonna pay a copay? How are they gonna pay premiums? How are they gonna pay for anything? I mean, yes, there are some people for whom, you know, this so-called skin in the game might help, but for the people that I deal with, they can't afford it. It just doesn't work for them. So we have got, and I agree absolutely 100% with what Father Dan just said, healthcare is not a privilege, it is a right. How can we have a healthy community? How can we have healthy individuals? How can we have uh, healthy children? If they can't get to a dentist, they can't get eyeglasses, they can't get health care. You say, well, that doesn't happen that often. It does. It happens all the time. I see it. I see it every day. Or I'm sorry, I'm only open one day a week because we have other jobs so we can make a living. But, you know, on the, on the, the Thursday that we have our clinic, we see people who just amaze us at how resilient they become when they get just simple health care. They're not asking for, for, you know, lung transplants and all they want is basic health care. And that's what we're trying to give them. So I'll summarize because I don't want to take too long. Uh, what, what we have to understand is there are vulnerable people all over the state who without the, the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, without the Medicaid expansion, will not be able to get health care. And that is very sad. And keep in mind that the word vulnerable means wounded. All right, these are people who are wounded and we are able to care for them and then they become healthy. And it's going to involute and they're gonna go back to being sick again. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Tyler Offerman, is a working Kentuckian. He is here to present in his own words his concerns about Governor Bevan's plan. 
Hello, y'all. My name's Tyler Offerman, a uh, working Kentuckian. Um, I'm a 27-year young Lexingtonian, uh, and I'm here today mostly just to tell my story. I'm a young entrepreneur. Last year, me and a friend started an outdoor adventure guiding company. Uh, we specialize in outdoor adventure tourism in eastern Kentucky, uh, basically trying to take as many wealthy tourists to spend their money in eastern Kentucky as possible. Um, we think it's a very integral part of the economic diversification that's going to be happening in eastern Kentucky, and we're really proud of the work that we've been doing. Um, but uh, as anyone that knows who's ever tried to do a startup, it is a lot of work at first. The first two to three years, I mean, I work a full-time job uh, at a restaurant, you know, sometimes 40, maybe 50 hours a week, and then with every extra hour that I have, I invest that into my startup business and every extra dollar that I own goes into that same business. Um, but even still doing that for the next two to three years, it won't be at a place to be profitable. So for this uh, two to three year period, you know, a little help would be great. And um, my real story is that in 2014, I enrolled in the Affordable Care Act and uh, got put on Medicaid and I got to do, over the past two years, about $6,000 in dental work that I would not have been able to do otherwise. The strange coincidence there is that I had to take out a $6,000 loan to start my business. So, in some ways, Medicaid allowed me to start a business because I did not have to take that money and sink it into my medical needs, which were starting to pile up. Believe it or not, 27-year-old people have health problems. I just had to get uh, my wisdom teeth removed because they were impacted, and I'm missing a part of my jaw because my tooth dug into it. So that, that's a real thing that uh, I had to deal with and I wouldn't have been able to deal with if it wasn't for Medicaid. So the Bevan administration's plan, I just want to say as a young entrepreneur and working person, would be a disaster for people like me. I probably wouldn't have been able to start my business I probably would have gotten a cracked molar and probably would have got a pretty nasty infection that would have escalated to all the other things that I think um, speakers are here talking about today. And I can just say as a young person who recently graduated from college, the recent cuts to university and colleges are going to lead to higher tuition and more student debt. And if we're asking students to graduate into a depressed job market with extraordinary amounts of debt, there's no way we can become entrepreneurs and job creators. Like, I would like to be able to be a job creator in Kentucky, and Medicaid uh, allows me to do that. So I think the raises on tuition coupled with, with Medicaid would be a real one-two punch for young entrepreneurs in this state. And also, this, this My Rewards thing, this is nonsense. I can tell you as a working person, you know, I spend 40 hours a week at my one job, 20 to 30 hours a week for my startup, and to think that a working person's gonna have time to go out and do this kind of stuff just to be afforded uh, medical care is, I mean, it's nonsense. No working person would think that this is possible. Some bureaucrat cooked this up, because this does not make sense. And also, I just wanted to say, on this form, this graph that the um, CHFS put out, $38 for a filling, like, I used to get into work without health insurance and it's about 150 to 170 dollars per filling so I don't know where these numbers came from but they don't make any sense and lastly to assume that people like me are lazy or, or are you know like mooches to the system is totally offensive I am an entrepreneur I'm trying to create a job and create a living for myself and the kind of rhetoric that's coming out of the Bevan administration is very offensive so I'm just here to say that I think um, it's very important to offer these critical supportive services to young people as we transition out of school and try to become job makers and job creators. And if that support's not there, then don't expect young entrepreneurs to stay in Kentucky because we will have to leave. So thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Our next speaker is Mark Skierman. Uh, 
thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm here on behalf, basically, of my, my daughter. Uh, she's 49 years old. She was uh, born with developmental disabilities. The first thing I'd like to say is she, fortunately, knock on wood, she is as healthy as a horse. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with her health. And the idea that we're constantly being accused of something that's you know, proving that she's not healthy when she is healthy is not the problem. Her problem is her IQ. Her IQ is not very high. And that's the way she was born. Uh, so far, we have yet to find a doctor that knows how to improve it, and yet we're constantly being told that that's what you have to do. Uh, when she was born, she did not have the right to attend school. It just didn't exist. I was one of the families, I was one of the parents that fought hard to get Public Law 94 and 142, and we've been fighting ever since for all kinds of, of things for our daughters that other, my other three daughters just take for granted. Uh, what, uh, and now we're discovering even when you get it, it becomes at risk, and then you, you're, you're going to lose it. Uh, I'm a retired Army. My wife reminded me that when we uh, retired that we'd move 17 times in those 26 years. And never once was my daughter allowed to go to the same school as her three sisters, not once. One time they sent her to a different school, one time a different county, another time a different state, another time they sent her to a different country, and somehow the bureaucrats all thought that was a good deal. <laughs> and we were saying, why can't she just go to school with herself? And that's the idea that somebody above you makes these rules for you. And the other thing that, that we were constantly being told by the people who were, quote, helping my, my daughter is that they're looking out for her best interests as if we're not. <laughs> and it turns out that their best interests and what we think are the best interests don't coincide. You know, what, what I'm uh, afraid of right now, and, and she, my daughter does not get any state funding. She does not get Medicaid. She does not get SEL. And my wife and I elected not to try to get her those things because there's a waiting list. And from what we know, there's always going to be a waiting list. And, and we're not wealthy, but we can afford the tuition that she gets at St. Mary's, that she has to pay for St. Mary's Center. And since there's a waiting list, we think that, that this is our part of helping other families who can't afford it, for them to allow to get to go and have the same opportunities that, that our daughter has. And what we're looking at, there are two things that, there, that, that are that we're worried about. One is the funding of St. Mary's Center. Now, St. Mary's Center was started by two nuns that were teachers that worked with their kids all the way through school. And then when they, when they got past school age, there was nothing for them to do. And they started St. Mary's Center. And it just so happens we showed up in Kentucky in the same situation and my daughter joined them. They know what they're doing. That is not a problem. They're very competent at what they're doing. What they don't need is your opinion on what to do. What they need is your help. And, and I've, one of the things I've discovered with, with a daughter like myself, whether I could be the richest person in the world, I could have all the assets I need, but with my, with my oldest daughter, if she's going to have a life, a decent life, one that we, we value and she values, we're going to need the help of the village. That's all there is to it. My other three daughters all have master's degrees, very proud of them, they're doing very well. And St. Mary's, which we're, I'm, I'm always fundraising, happen to have a golf scramble coming up. If anybody wants to do it, I've got forms for you to do that. We'd love to have you. But what we need is your help, not your dictates. The other thing that, that bothers me are the dictates. So there's two, it's funds and the dictates. Uh, it's amazing how many people think that they know what's best for my daughter. The latest thing, for example, that they're talking about is what they call the final rule, which, which is kind of like the final solution. <laughs> they, they, what they'll say is they don't like the idea that my daughter and her friends all go out in the community together. They call it congregate setting. And somehow that's a very bad term, and I don't know why it's a bad term, because she enjoys it, and she enjoys it very much. And she looks forward to going out with her friends into the community, and now we're being told that there's a threat that, that they're going to have to decide who stays back at St. Mary's where the others go out into the community so they won't be accused of congregate setting. I don't know who came up with that idea, but it doesn't fit our situation. 
Uh, what, if, and I am dependent on Medicaid whether I like it or not. St. Mary's Center, 83, 83% of St. Mary's Center get their funding from Medicaid. And, and so if they, if they get cuts and they can't afford it, I lose St. Mary's Center. So whether I like it or not, I'm dependent on Medicaid, even though we don't, we don't get it. Uh, uh, I, would, I would love to know, and, and then Emily tells me that 30% of the population is receiving Medicaid. That is a huge group of people. They're very diverse. They're just as diverse as the regular population. And the idea that, that you can have these little square holes and then try to pound everybody into them makes no sense whatsoever. And such a large, diverse group requires a large, diverse care. And we know what we're doing. And, we, and, and the idea that somebody out there thinks that they can, they can tell what's right for my daughter when they've never met her, they've never worked with her, they don't know anything about her, just drives us crazy. So what we're looking for, and, and my latest fear now is cuts for St. Mary's Center. We, we've, we've experienced some of it, and the people, when, when we get cut at St. Mary's Center, the people who get cut first are the people that we're depending on the most, the staff that is caring for our daughters. And we have lost, I can't tell you how many outstanding people who know our daughter, they love our daughter, they just can't afford to work with her. And they've gotten out and they've gotten better paying jobs. And they, I don't know how many tearful goodbyes we've had from wonderful people who don't want to leave, but they have to leave because they can't afford to stay. So we need, we need more funding for places like St. Mary's Center. We have to believe that places like St. Mary's Center and all the other groups that care for this population know what they're doing. They're confident what they're doing. They're doing it because they care and they care about the people they're dealing with. What we've got to do is help them help us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is NAMI Lexington Health Advocate James Hagee. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I trust my outrageous foreign accent isn't going to cause you any trouble today. Good morning, Todd. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, um, along with others from Participation Station the peer run center for those with severe mental illness that is operated through NAMI Lexington, the bluegrass affiliate of the National Alliance for Mental Illness. I tried and traveled to come to Frankfurt for the first public hearing to give some testimony, but was unable to. I had to leave uh, because of other obligations and the line was out of the door, obviously speaking to the brevity and magnitude of what happens, what we believe as advocates is happening with this proposed waiver expansion. Michael, in a moment, you're going to hear from a, a compatriot of mine, Michael Beard. He can speak far more eloquently than me to the lived experience of somebody with severe mental illness who is a Medicaid recipient. But I will go ahead and just kind of set the stage for you. Um, as a mental health advocate, over and over, time and time again, I have seen the same challenges that the population for whom I advocate face. Uh, that is the challenge of navigating our healthcare system. With the proposed waiver, those challenges will obviously become a little more convoluted and obviously multiply. Uh, while many Medi Medi Medicaid members have told me that their proposed premium will propose a barrier to getting service, I'm specifically advocating for those that are deemed medically frail. The lack of stable address, changeable nature of transitional housing, people moving from Eastern State Hospital and institutional care into transitional settings present a huge barrier for people to be able to receive their billing for copay, premium, service, however you wish to describe it. I, I am deeply concerned that also people who live with severe and persistent mental illness may not even open the mail through fear, through pure symptomatic behavior. And while the medically frail are not subject to a lockout, we can just simply fast forward through our train of thought and arrive at a, a 
Yeah. A destination whereby somebody who has not opened their mail or has not received their mail can become metaphorically locked out of coverage themselves because they simply don't know what they're supposed to do. I would very much like also to, uh, to consider uh, the potential for harm when this population, the medically frail with severe mental illness, fail to get care. Their recovery journey is derailed. We absolutely must 100% embrace a culture that uses recovery as its basic, basic ethos. We can't institutionalize people for life anymore. People deserve to be out in their communities thriving as they wish to do in their own self-directed terms. The cost of getting someone back into coverage after a lapse will far outweigh the simple dollar amount of a copay or a premium. In closing, uh, in the public comment session here at the Capitol, we heard from uh, AJ, the bootstrapping Kentuckian. I don't know whether he's here today. Uh, he told of working multiple jobs uh, and yet still had difficulty maintaining a decent standard of living, one in which he afforded him some disposable income that he would have to spend on his health care. It is my humble opinion that in addressing these uh, bootstrapping Kentuckians, uh, as we move towards addressing health care for all, we make sure that the humble bootstrap does not compound with poverty and severe mental illness and turn into a noose. Thank you. We're going to go slightly out of order and invite Dr. Eli Pendleton to come forward. He's a family practice provider in Louisville, Kentucky. And Welcome. Thank you. As stated, I have the honor of being a family physician caring for impoverished adult and pediatric patients in Louisville, and I'm deeply troubled and dismayed by Governor Bevin's proposed Medicaid waiver. The adoption of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion in our state had immediate and lasting effect on the health of almost half a million Kentuckians. In Jefferson County alone, over 67,000 people were able to get coverage. I had people come to me with tears in their eyes, overjoyed that they were finally able to take charge of their health problems. I had people quit smoking, get their blood pressure and diabetes under control, get much needed glasses, and finally address long-standing dental issues. Many of these patients were, they were able to then enthusiastically rejoin the workforce and once again contribute to the state economy and their own well-being. I had caregivers finally taking care of themselves rather than just their children, parents, and dependents. I felt the palpable relief that came with the ability to address long-standing medical problems that affected the entire family, and I saw the downstream benefits to those same children, parents, and dependents. I worry that Governor Bevin's plan will erase all of this progress and more. We know that premiums tend to decrease overall coverage. We know that copays decrease frequency of visits and discourage people from seeking needed care. Lockouts compromise the management of complex <coughs> chronic disease and increase downstream costs, both to the patient and to the system as a whole. And impoverished patients, many of whom live in a state of chaos and toxic stress, are not helped by complex requirements for extended coverage. I trust the spirit in which these changes are proposed is well-intentioned and patient-centered. However, the results, I fear, will be the direct opposite. The expansion of Medicaid coverage has been an amazing step forward in the health of our state. I've been congratulated by out-of-state colleagues at regional and national conferences who are envious of our state's health care environment. We should be focused on building upon the victories of the recent past and continuing to encourage the health of this state. Let us please not take this step backwards. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Next, we welcome mental health consumer Michael Beard. Good morning. My name is Michael Beard, and I'm a resident of Lexington, Kentucky. And I've been a Medicaid recipient for many years. And for myself, being diagnosed at an early age, 14 years old to be exact, it was one of my toughest journeys that I could ever start. And to the most um, 
difficult words to ever use to describe such a journey are rough and rocky, especially if it comes to health care and insurance. Um, let's see, by the time I was even in my mid-twenties, difficulties really extended more because I had extra diagnosis to be added to what I already had. So being on Medicaid, it was made me a pain pension experience where I had to watch dollars and cents, especially with co-pays. So just dishing out co-pay if you're already on limited in income was already difficult. It, that included my medicines, doctor's visits, and different types of exams. For me, uh, life would actually be scary to have to dig into my pockets for Medicaid co-pays and extra expenses. So in closing, I will say that limited incomes are very tough, especially if you're trying to afford any type of insurance, including Medicaid. So I will say that co-pays and extra Medicaid-related expenses are really tough. And my question is, how can a person afford insurance if they don't have an income? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beard. Um, we have two more speakers, in case you're wondering how, how many, what the lineup looks like. Our next speaker is Carl Owens. He's a board member of Kentucky Voices for Health and retired senior counsel for Legal Aid Society of Southwest Ohio. Thanks, Rich. Well, good morning. As Rich said, I'm a recently retired legal aid lawyer, uh, redeployed is what I call it, um, from Ohio. I'm a northern Kentuckian, lifelong Kentuckian, and actually an eighth generation Kentuckian. But I did earn my bread over there for 30 years with legal aid and uh, during that period of time worked on primarily a lot of health care issues, especially those with reference to Medicaid, since so many of our clients at legal aid were dependent on Medicaid for getting health care. Many didn't. They weren't eligible for any health care, so they went without. Or they, you know, got what you can get in the system and those costs were redistributed. Ohio adopted the Medicaid expansion in 2013 with the very strong support of Governor Kasich. And I give credit where it's due. He was heroic in, in pursuing the adoption of the Medicaid expansion because he understood from personal experience and from whatever else was going on in his life the value for people and for the state. Economically, in terms of health care, in terms of the, the dignity of people, and in terms of the well-being of our workforce. He supported it. The uh, Republican-dominated legislature did not, so there was quite a battle over it, but ultimately it uh, prevailed. And some 600,000 Ohioans have benefited from it. Pretty amazing. Many of them getting health care for the first time, and I think that's reflected here as well. Ohio is now seeking a waiver to redesign its program, ironically or not, at the behest of the legislature, not the administration. As we all know, Governor Bashir expanded Medicaid here in Kentucky by executive action. In some sense, its implementation also equally phenomenally. 400,000 people, plus or minus, have received care in the first year or two of implementation. It's pretty incredible. And uh, most everybody agrees this is a good thing. We, we've heard, you know, this Kaiser uh, Family Foundation poll referenced by a number of people, I think it was in December of 2015, that 72 percent of Kentuckians like the expansion and think it should be left alone. Well, but at the same time, Governor Bevins won an election with, on a promise of taking this thing down, so it, it introduces uh, some interesting uh, dynamics and tensions. He has uh, instead at this point developed a proposal for the waiver. And it's based on several assumptions that I want to address here very quickly. One, that low-income Kentuckians do not understand private insurance, don't take advantage of it. Secondly, that they don't adequately appreciate the coverage that they receive and need some help in uh, doing that. Thirdly, that they will not work unless they're required to. And fourthly, that they need to have skin in the game, quote unquote, we hear that all the time, 
by paying copayments, deductibles, and premiums in order to achieve dignity. Now, these assumptions, in my judgment, are all demonstrably inaccurate, and I want to tell you why. First of all, not taking advantage of employer insurance. A failure of many low-income workers to take advantage of employer insurance where offered, in most low-wage jobs it's not, but, but where it is has little to do, I can assure you, with understanding insurance and virtually everything to do with affordability. And common sense, vast experience and studies uh, conclusively demonstrate that. Costs in the healthcare world are rising much faster than wages. Wages are stagnant and they have been for decades. Costs are rising astronomically, have been for years. Um, so that's working in the wrong direction. Also, with employers, the uh, availability of employer-sponsored insurance is declining. 1980, it was 70%. Today, it's about 56%. So that's a declining part of the world. Employers, many of them, finding it just increasingly undoable. So it's less of an option for workers generally. It's much less of an option for low-income workers, and it's increasingly unaffordable. That's what's going on with private insurance. Secondly, I want to talk about churning for a minute. Churning is the phenomenon where people go on and off coverage, and this is sometimes related to the perception that people don't appreciate coverage or aren't willing to, you know, do what they need to do to maintain it and so forth. Um, churning is the failure to renew on a timely basis when you're supposed to uh, or some other administrative failure. It's not because of a lack of appreciation for the program. It's more related to the program complexity, certainly the complexity of the application and renewal process. Uh, I can assure you, we, it's happened here, it's happened at Ohio, it's happened here with Benefine, with their <coughs> systems for other reasons. Tens of thousands of people can lose coverage because, you know, it doesn't go to the right place. Uh, they don't get it, the, the, the application package, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's a very, very complex system in that regard. And as well, the instability of a lot of low-income people's lives. I mean, they're dealing on a daily basis with all kinds of challenges, and um, it's hard to do these things. Continuous and predictable coverage is the best way to address churning, and it has over time demonstrated to and will continue to. Thirdly, the work requirement. I have very strong feelings about this. It is a great fallacy to believe that low-income people must be forced to work by holding out goods or services or things that they need and, and uh, you know, coerce them through some sort of behavior modification model uh, to do the right thing in order to get the thing that they desperately need. The truth about Medicaid is quite the opposite. It's what allows people to work. And we have to hear that. People have to understand that. Be people take jobs, the jobs that are available to them are low-wage jobs with no benefits. And so they are vulnerable as a worker in such a situation to any potential health care problem, illness, accident, injury, chronic illness, you name it. You know, it's not about, I don't think I want to work. It's about, you know, vulnerability for them, for their family. I have a friend here today who has a remarkable family story if she gets to tell it. Um, you've heard many, there are many, many, many more. but. Um, Low-income people face obstacles to work unquestionably. Education and skills deficits, health issues, lack of transportation, simply the lack of jobs in some areas, especially, for example, Eastern Kentucky. But notwithstanding these challenges, data show, and they show about the Kentucky population, expansion population, that most work, especially most without disabilities of one sort or another. Finally, skin in the game. This is perhaps, <laughs> I think, the most easily disproved of all of these assumptions. Self-sufficiency studies typically show the living costs for varying size families in specific communities or counties. They take into consideration basic living costs, housing, food, utilities, health care, child care, transportation, etc. They routinely show that while many low-wage jobs, especially those close to the minimum wage, pay below poverty wages for full-time work, below poverty wages for full-time work, that their needs actually almost universally come up to about the 200 percent of poverty level when you add all the costs of all that stuff up that people have to do, especially if they're going to work. You can't leave the kids home alone. It's illegal. It's immoral. So you've got to have child care and on and on. So low-wage workers 
do not earn enough money to achieve economic stability for their families, and it's simply untrue, demonstrably untrue, that they have enough sufficient disposable discretionary income in order to pay co-pays, deductibles, and premiums. I would conclude by saying this. Low-income people, like all people, need health care. Medicaid provides that. They want to work if they're able to provide for themselves and their families. Medicaid helps them do that. They, like all people, want dignity. Medicaid helps provide that. And finally, they want to get ahead economically so they can assume greater responsibility and ability in their lives to pay their way. And Medicaid certainly helps with that. So Medicaid's achieved terrific gains for hundreds of thousands of Kentuckians. It is an amazing accomplishment in a year or two. And over time, by the way, it's going to more than pay for the state's investment uh, by reducing health care costs and conditions, by increasing employment, creating health care jobs, reducing uncompensated care costs that get inefficiently, unfairly, and dishonestly distributed to the rest of the population because they're not paid in a straightforward and honest way like Medicaid does. And by increasing revenue from a healthier, more productive workforce. We should keep it as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Our final speaker is Sister Mary Joyce Muller, a sister of divine providence. Welcome, Sister. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I didn't um, know I would get this chance, but yes, I'm a sister of Divine Providence. Um, our sisters have lived and worked uh, many, many years in all the counties in southeast Kentucky. I've, I've visited them all. I know the people. I've lived in Appalachia for 17 years. Um, I've dealt with situations like uh, what Deacon Grimes has shared with us. So I, I want to speak on behalf of the poor and low-income people of, of all of Kentucky. Now I'm in um, a near Boone, Boone County that has a, a great uh, poverty population that experiences some of the same difficulties. But I'm speaking out of my experience in southeastern Kentucky. And I think the people there will be seriously and negatively impacted by the changes that are proposed in the Kentucky Health Plan. If it goes into effect, many will lose their insurance. But to understand why, it's really important to, to learn and appreciate the reality of the people's affected. And I think you've gotten much of that in the sharing thus far today. But the majority of people that I lived with and worked with and served in the Kentucky mountains want to work, as one of the speakers said, and provide for their families. But there are not nearly enough available jobs, and unfortunately, many people lack the education and the kind of skills needed for the few good-paying jobs that do exist. The closing of the coal mines and the low-paying jobs that most do work in leave them with insufficient income to support their families, pay their basic bills, make car payments, afford health insurance, or any other kind of insurance. Many even work two or three part-time jobs. Now, part-time because that's all that many of them are able to get. But still, they can't make ends meet. They cannot afford higher education or skills training, and they can't afford to move to other places where there might be jobs. They didn't create the poor situation that they're in. It's the result, more the result, of a long history of the colonization of Appalachia and the economic disparity in our society. The Kentucky Health Plans, as we've heard, requires that a person after, a pro after being in the program for three months, requires that they work, do community service, or be in some educational or training program. This requirement would be very difficult for the people that I have known in Southeast Kentucky because many of them do not have a reliable means of transportation or the necessary education or skills or because they're caring for a sick or an elderly person or for grandchildren or nieces and nephews so that their parents can work or because they can't afford child care or some have a criminal record that bars them from many jobs 
and volunteer opportunities. So these requirements, in my view, are just not realistic. And then the premiums and the lock lockout stipulations that the plan would oppose, the necessity of keeping track of re-enrollment schedules and all the details in the health savings account, in the My Rewards account, the lack of retroactive coverage would be a hardship and cause many to lose their insurance because of an inability to keep up with the premiums or out of sheer confusion and frustration. The Benefide Program and the Federal Government Health Pro Program one would also need to access just would add to the confusion. Even I, with master's degrees, <laughs> get unnerved and, for, and, and uh, totally frustrated with all the rules and regulations that are required by Medicare and Medicaid and prescription plan. I've spent hours on the telephone trying to work out glitches in the system, straighten out bills. Now, from my experience with people with minimal education and communication skills, I just don't think that they'll be able to handle all the complexities in the Kentucky Health Plan. I believe they will just let their health condition deteriorate until they're forced to go to the emergency room or to the hospital as they have done in the past. Similar requirements in waivers in Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wisconsin caused a big drop in coverage, almost half in Oregon. The plan also eliminates vital benefits low-income people just cannot afford. And we've heard this, dental, vision coverage, hearing exams, hearing aids. I've known people with gum diseases and others who cannot go and see the doctor uh, or, or get glasses for years. One woman uh, I knew who had pyorrhea for years, she would go around whenever she talked with people, she'd cover her mouth so others would not be offended by the odor. Why? She just simply could not afford to go to the dentist. And there are many cases like this. Kentucky ranks high in the nation in the number of adults who've had teeth extracted because of tooth decay or gum disease because they've let their condition continue because of lack of money for dental care. Statistics show that, and someone pointed this out, that benefits earned in the My Rewards plan could not possibly cover the cost of basic dental and vision care. Dropping transportation for non-emergency medical care would also just make matters worse for the folks I have dealt with in Southeast Kentucky who either do not have cars or they don't have money for repairs, they don't have money for gas, there's no transportation or very little exists, you know, in other places too. Most cannot afford car insurance. So if we want people to be able to afford health insurance and not depend on the government for medical assistance, we must provide better education and opportunity for higher education in low-income communities, enough job, jobs and livable wages. Putting into effect a health care plan with all these stipulations and requirements will not solve Kentucky's serious health care problems. The Kentucky health plan is cumbersome and unworkable. It would reverse the progress in health care that Kentucky has achieved in the past two years. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Um, I knew Emily would do a better job than me. We have one more person who says she can address us in three minutes or so. So I appreciate that and welcome you, Serena Owens. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity to share our family story. My name is Serena Owen. I'm an educator, a youth ministry worker, a loving mother and wife of a, a Marine veteran and he's also a retired, retired teacher. I'm also a community advocate and a state advocate for Kentuckians. Uh, Kentucky Medicaid expansion has been a blessing to our family to say the least. Um, 
And like uh, we're one of the, um, the many hardworking, low-income families that um, has, have really benefited from Kentucky Expanded Medicaid. And um, in fact, according to the, uh, the Kaiser poll, 72% of Kentuckians want to keep expanded Medicaid without any changes, and we're one of those families. Uh, we want to help create healthier communities and help move Kentucky forward and not backwards. Uh, echoing Kentucky Voices for Health, Kentucky Medicaid expansion um, has been a tremendous success, and we need to uh, take steps that build on that rather than going back. Uh, my husband and I created an online change.org petition as well as a hard copy petition um, asking our Governor Bevan to give Kentuckians a voice and a choice in their health care. And I want to thank all of the um, Kentuckians and even supporters from Washington, D.C. that we got to sign um, this petition in support of giving Kentuckians more of a voice and a choice in the health care. It reads, Dear Honorable Governor Bevan, when the Kentucky waivers that our children with disabilities, and this is the Michelle P. waiver, um, that our children with disabilities qualified and recertified for and were receiving were unjustly taken away from them without due process after we requested a case manager within the same agency. Our children were retaliated against and uh, left without much needed health care, mental health and community supports. They were left without pain management care, left without other important, um, like my son, his um, heart care, my daughter's um, care that provided supports for her autism and um, sleep apnea and other health services. Our family was more stressed. We as parents were left without respite care. Our children ended up in the emergency rooms and our young daughter was admitted into the hospital several times for suicidal ideation. The waiver system abandoned and left our children for dead. We were denied a fair hearing when we requested one from the cabinet and I feared that this might happen with other families within the, with the changes in the, uh, the health care um, and given us no voice and no hope to find resolution. When we thought all that we had was more health concerns, medical bills, a hopeless case, and a prayer, we turned to KY Connect, expanded Medicaid. And that coverage saved our children's lives. So we're very grateful. According to the Kentucky Cabinets for Health and Family Services for Medicaid Services, um, monthly membership counts by county. As of March 2016, there are more than 84,000 people who are uh, Kentucky Medicaid recipients in our hometown, our current hometown of Northern Kentucky. Over 64,000 Kentucky Medicaid recipients in Lexington, Kentucky, over 50 um, thousand collectively in Hopkinsville, Paducah, and Madisonville, Kentucky, and most of Eastern Kentucky also, which is sadly one of our poorest um, parts of our country, and over 200,000 Kentucky Medicaid recipients in our family's hometown of Jefferson County, Louisville, Kentucky. And many of those um, don't have computers to go online to submit a comment, stamps to mail in a comment, um, they have transportation barriers, uh, so they can't travel out of town to a public hearing, and they don't have easy access, um, you know, to, to do that in order to have a voice. So they need a public hearing within, um, within reach in their hometown so that they can share their testimony and offer suggestions, give supports, and ask questions to better understand the changes that will affect them. As parents, educators, and um, uh, my husband, a U.S. veteran, community state advocate, um, and we're also Kentucky colonels, like you, uh, we strive each day to help improve the quality of life of families, but not just our family, but other Kentuckians. In our um, governor's welcome address, he, um, he stressed and encouraged us 
to embody the essence of our nation's pledge to indeed be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Our family didn't have liberty or justice in our Medicaid waiver situation. And KY Connect and expanded Medicaid turned our situation around and saved lives. We, along with concerned Kentuckians and supporters, thank you for holding uh, public hearings in Bowling Green, Frank Frankfurt, and, ha and Hazard. And we ask, will you please give Kentuckians liberty, justice, and help save lives by scheduling public hear hearings in uh, highly affected areas of Northern Kentucky, Louisville, Jefferson County, Lexington, Eastern Kentucky, Hopkinsville, Madisonville, Paducah area, um, and which will give more Kentuckians, especially in her areas highly affected, a voice to share how they feel about the changes to Kentucky Medicaid that will affect their health and life. This opportunity will not only um, help inform and give Kentucky Medicaid recipients a much needed voice, it will help build healthier communities and a healthier democracy. Thanks for believing in the golden rule, Governor Bevan. <laughs> which he shared in a personal conversation with my mother and I. Um, and we're, because of that, we're asking our governor um, to show that he believes in the, in the golden rule and to please schedule more public hearings to give Kentucky families like ours a voice and a choice in their health care. Thank you all. And thank you, Governor, and God bless you. Thank you, everybody, and we'll make available contact information.